Hello, and welcome to the MIT Open Documentary Lab talk. I'm Sarah Wallison, and I'm the director of the lab. And today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sharon Clark, who's a playwright and a creative director of Raucous, which is a UK-based, female-led, immersive theater company that fuses performance, music, film, augmented reality, AI, and other creative technologies. You can read more about her in the chat. Uh, today, she's going to talk about how she harnesses creative technologies and mixed realities in the curation of female-led narratives that weave historical fact with fiction. She's really interesting how she it pushes the boundaries of space and time in theater performances. So before I pass it on to Sharon, I just want to remind people to put their questions in the Q&A. We will have some time at the end of her lecture uh, to take questions. And now we'll go to Sharon. Here you go. Without further ado, Sharon. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks so much for inviting me um, to join you today. I'm going to share my screen with you. Uh, and hoping you'll be able to see everything there. Is that okay, everybody? Um, hope you can see that okay. Um, good, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And like I said, it's amazing to be here with you all today. Um, I wanna to talk today about building what we call building new narrative corridors. Um, and I wanna start by basically a disclaimer um, of, uh, Sorry, one second, my computer is, there we go. Is This is the position I want to start this talk from, is ostensibly I am not a technologist and I can't code and I don't know how AI works or how AR works. I think it's still a magic trick. I'm ostensibly a playwright, that's what I do. I write for a space and a place that's specifically created for one purpose, which is theater. And that that has inbuilt and recognized rituals. Um, it's all about storytelling for me. Everything comes back to story and how I, as a storyteller, can imbue my narratives with life and light and where the audience can have a real sewn in experience of the narratives I want to put in front of them. So as a playwright, and I've been a playwright for about, I don't know, 20 years, um, and I've worked in traditional theatre forms for a long, long time. About 10 years ago, I began to think about a piece of work I wanted to make and suddenly realised that that story can't be contained. It couldn't be contained in a theatre space. It needed something else to lift it. It needed something else where the audience could actually feel what was going on rather than sit passively and just watch. And I began to think about how maybe technology might be a way forward to help me with some of the heavy lifting of the narrative. But the question was, how do I even think about that when technology in some way is a veiled curtain to me? In some ways, I don't even understand what that is. I know my own craft but how did I start to learn another discipline? I was lucky enough that I'm based in Bristol in the UK and um, we have the Pervasive Media Studio here. I think you heard from one of the cohort from that studio, Duncan Speakman, a few days ago, a few weeks ago, sorry. Um, and the Pervasive Media Studio is a place where creativity and technology come together to take risk and it's held and it's curated very carefully and you are introduced to things that make you feel a little afraid sometimes, but they are an, it's an extraordinary space in picking people up who have in ideas around how the creative industries might move forward. And they were really interested in my question around how I might write a play that has narrative and technology woven into it, where one isn't the adjunct of the other, that the idea for that play, for that piece, for that experience, is they're woven together. Um, so um, they invited me to go and play with them and um, they <laughs> gave me this incredible gift of an arranged creative marriage with uh, a technologist called Tom Burton. And um, we soon found out when on meeting each other that I knew nothing at all about technology. And interestingly, he knew nothing at all about theater. And 
we were sort of held and cradled to start conversations where we would start nudge, nudging up against each other's skill set and trying to have a kind of knowledge exchange between us about how we actually might make a story work for an audience together. Um, and at that time, this uh, was something I found, which is from Felix Barrett, who is, as you know, the creative genius behind Punch Drunk. And what he said was the idea is to avoid stagnation. Um, and if audiences get used to the rules and change them. So um, for us, that felt, for me, that felt really urgent and important that um, we had these set of rules that actually I could start thinking about and writing differently. So Tom and I came up with this name of Raucus, which at the time really didn't mean much. We didn't really know what it was. We just decided to give ourselves a name rather than Tom and Sharon. Um, and quickly, it sort of began to grow um, as we began to make further explorations into what it is we wanted to do. I wanted to change my relationship with an audience. I wanted to make it more intimate and immediate. I wanted my narratives to build and to occupy that different spaces. And Tom was keen on looking at how his knowledge of technology can then help lift a narrative. So we formed, we attracted, I don't know what we did, we bought in, we, we seduced a bunch of people who were also interested in the same questions and explorations, um, who came with us where we didn't see our audiences as a inert force, but as a group of people we could actually collude with. How can we collude with an audience to tell a narrative? And how? And we started to talk about building congregation and instilling communion and realize that we were still talking about ritual. But we, um, we came up with this company, Raucus, who are now resident at the Pervasive Media Studio. And we are an ever evolving collective of theater makers. There are technologists, there are now scientists and programmers. We work with music. So we have uh, composers and designers and we look at how technology and layered reality and immersion can help in theater and how it can build a future for the theater sector. I've always been a little puzzled by the theater sector not really running towards the possibilities of a massive collaboration with digital technology and mixed reality. Um, I just don't understand why theatre hasn't picked this baton up earlier and quicker. Um, it seems that uh, there has been a, a nervousness around theatre stories being built with technology. And, and I wanted to look at how I could, how we could bring in a theatre audience into a new world and a new space and show them the possibilities of theatre making in this way. We had lots of questions when we started. So many questions. Are we storytelling or are we story finding? How independent do we want our audience to be? How much agency should we give them? How much interaction? Is it branching narrative? Do they witness or are they involved? Do we nudge up against game mechanics or do we stay away from it? And how do we support our audience to curate their own experience? Um, I want to talk about story first and the stories we, we found that we were wanting to play with. And we soon realized that actually we'd managed to become a completely female company at one point. Um, we are now still female led. Um, and that we weren't aware, I don't think, that we had started to build a really st strong storytelling trope, which were we're beginning to build fiction out of history. We were looking back at history and at women's history. We were looking at how history can be a catalyst to build stories around women whose agency in their own lives had been denied them due to either social economic or geopolitical factors. So we were looking at female orchestra members in Leningrad in 1942, or wet nurses in the 17th century, or the German Jewish female communities in the uh, ghettos of the late 1930s. We were interested in also building our female protagonists so that they became myths in their own right. 
And we are never historically accurate. We don't see everything in history. We kind of build these, lean into what we call another world, where we mix fact and fantasy, um, history and politics in a way that feels sort of authentic, but has a seam of otherness running through it. Um, and also we are very, very keen in our story that not all, tech, not, not all surprises are delivered by technology. That the sense of awe and wonder we wanna imbue in our audience aren't lifted by AI or AR, but they're lifted by narrative as well. That the narrative also elicits that small gasp we want from our audience uh, as theater makers. So technology. I just want to talk very quickly about our relationship with this. This is our binaural sound designer, Helen Skiera, in obviously what is a magic leap, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Our first credo with technology when we all came together was that story is queen, she comes first. Um, we don't concern ourselves all the time with the latest digital technology. We concern ourselves with the right tool for the right job. And we are talking about application, not invention. We wanted technology and story to shake hands together in a live space with a live audience. I wanna be really clear that we don't invent technology. We don't come up with the latest thing, but we repurpose what is there. We reshape and we try to reimagine. We're taking what exists and introducing it to other forms, other disciplines. And it means that sometimes we actually exhume technology with technology moving on so fast, we also turn our heads to revisit the, the technology that may have been overlooked, say, I don't know, three, four years ago in the scramble for the latest version or the newest thing. Sometimes the best tools are slightly older than the newer ones. They've been honed, they work. Um, so really as a set of story makers and storytellers, we want to use tech that really helps us to interpret space and to re-engineer its relationship with an audience. For me, it's about scale. It's about how the narratives I can build then take into account scale through the layering of reality. And also then thinking about how kits such as Magic Leap that Helen is wearing there, how as a writer and a theater maker, do I get an audience maybe to have to use kit whilst keeping them in the world that I have so carefully built and we have all co-curated. And for me, I'm just gonna say this now and be bold and brave about it. For us right now, it's about AR, not VR in theatre. But this may change in time as VR changes. But for right now, as a company, we are really keen on looking at how we can layer an audience's expectation of story with augmented reality. Sometimes the big question is, why augment when the world can be enough anyway? And it's something we talk about all the time. This has led, of course, to us thinking about technology for the stories we tell and something we have come up with or something that we've been very um, keen on is the familiars, what we call familiars. It's object-based technology. And when we were thinking about how we uh, work with an audience with technology, I was very clear, clear that that audience that we're building for is an audience who are very theatre savvy, but not very tech savvy. So I wanted to give them something they carry or something they hold, something personal that at a particular moment in the play, in the narrative, that inanimate object will become animated and surprise them. Um, I'll go on to speak about familiars a bit in a minute, but we have spent a lot of time with, um, we've got product designers on board, um, looking at how we can make something that should be static become an emotional lightning rod for the story? How can we get somebody to hold something and then halfway through the play, that something starts to vibrate or move or temperature change or something in line with a the narrative? Um, their personal investment is, their audience's personal investment is in what they wear or what they carry and that these familiars are sewn into the story. They have a place in it. They also deliver narrative. How do I write for familiars? How do I think about it? They are all personalized. So each uh, familiar, 
they change in different shows. Um, I'll talk about those a bit more in a minute, but each familiar has that audience member's name on it. Everything we wanna do is also heavily personalized. So uh, they're personalized. We don't reinvent tech, but we repurpose it. We surprise, but not intimidate. It's really important for me that we don't put audiences off by using technology that they feel they can either get wrong or they feel stupid using. We, we animate the inanimate, we underscore the emotional moment of the script, and we allow the audience to feel the scenography. They feel haptically, tangibly what's going on. We build a congregation by the use of familiars. They talk to each other when the familiars start to uh, react. We cast the audience as a character with a role in the narrative through the familiar. And we always want to instill a sense of awe and wonder. Of course, this means a huge, a huge transdisciplinary collaboration between people. Um, new methods of communication have had to be learnt, new rules of engagement and redefinition of process that we take for granted. I have to explain how I think about theatre stories to people when I've never really examined it that well myself. We have to unwrap process and experimenting with it is incredibly risky. So we have to kind of make up methodologies and processes which take time and money and a toll on the team as we try to mitigate risk and failure. Because we need to hold a space for messiness and uncertainty. And we need to dissolve hierarchies and traditional roles and traditional labels for those roles. We have had to completely rethink the labels for what each of us does, the roles we have, and they have expanded and contracted as necessary. Our first show was called, is, was called The Stick House in 2015, and it was in uh, railway tunnels under Bristol Temple Mead Station, which is our main railway terminus in Bristol. The tunnels have not been open for 80 years. Um, and we were interested in uh, looking at the world of Angela Carter, a British novelist who deals with magical realism, and also uh, being inspired design-wise by the work of Otto Dix. Um, the Stick House was a uh, modern, uh, a fairy tale, allegedly, um, that the audience walked into the uh, tunnels with. Um, and um, it was about, for me, about looking at the tropes of Angela Carter around feminist storytelling, but then slowly the audience began to realize halfway through that this wasn't a fairy tale and that actually they were in Bavaria in 1938 at the outbreak of um, the Second World War and they were actually watching um, the uh, life of a young Jewish girl. Um, this is one of the tunnels, it was seven tunnels. We, this is a table and chairs, which were huge in the space that we used in projection mapping. Uh, this is our lead actress. Um, this is moments of immersion in another room in the tunnels. These are just some of the images. This is projection mapping. Uh, we mapped the, all of the archways in the tunnels so that we could um, uh, make them explode. So what happened was that they would then uh, shatter and the space would go to black as if the space had imploded in on itself. Uh, this is some projection mapping of a world we used in one of the tunnels. And it was really important to us, for instance, tangibly and tactilely that Christopher there, the actor is on grass and it's real grass. And we grew up underground hydroponically. It was really important that the tactile world also um, was reinvigorated. This is uh, Chris uh, uh, with uh, the familiar for Stick House, which um, I will show you at the moment. And through him using it, he showed our audience what it might be capable of. And this is our audience in a moment of communion or congregation, as I talk about, where they find their familiars. They were little corn dolls, I'll show you a picture. And at this moment, they come down in a tin bath from above and um, they are calling out to each other because the dolls had each individual person's name on. So they began to work together to distribute the dolls. The narrative drivers, as we call them in our company for this show, of course, was live performance. There was a lot of film in it on walls. There was a lot of character projection mapping. So there was a little girl who sort of jumped out of a screen and ran along a wall. 
and led us into another space. There was architectural projection mapping, space disintegration. We had robotic bugs that showed people the way through the tunnels. It was a sort of push-pull for the audience. Um, we had ghosts in mirrors. We had the object-based tech, which we're talking about, the familiars, which were little wood, uh, little straw dolls. There was original composition and there was directional sound to help move an audience and to curate their journey. We use a lot of scent in our work. Um, and then there was an offboarding, a small offboarding mobile device moment. Two days later, your phone rang and you heard the roar of the wild, the roar of the beast. Um, this is one of the dolls we made. There were 60 of them. Um, they um, were all individually designed. They all had your name on. You were given them halfway through the show. And what happened was at the moment of greatest jeopardy, when Marietta, our protagonist, was in fear for her life, the dolls got a heartbeat in your hand and a little red heart began to beat out. Um, they were all different heartbeats. And as the danger got worse, so uh, the heartbeat quickens. And then at a moment where she, um, she vanquished the foe, they, the doll spasmed. And the idea behind them was that, um, sorry, I think I've gone, there we are. The idea behind them was that you would feel the scenography, you could feel what was going on. Um, Great. The second show we did was Ice Road in 2017, which was based on the siege of Leningrad. I'm a, I've become a bit of a Russia, Russian history nut. I don't know how that happened, but I have. Very interested in the siege of Leningrad and the fact that during the siege, when um, you know millions of people died of starvation, the theatres and the orchestras remained open and working with the audiences dying in the theatres and the actors dying on stage. And I thought it was incredible that a time of great strife and, and fear, culture was what brought people together. I was also interested at the time in, in map in um, tattooing, Russian tattoos. And we were looking at the time at body mapping, maybe through projection mapping, mapping onto our actors' bodies, tattoos that would then morph and help tell the story. So we made the story about an orchestra, and a young female flautist who had um, adopted some abandoned children. I went to Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, and met some survivors, female survivors of the, um, of the war and took some authentic testimonies from them to take back to use in the show. Um, this is Leah, uh, who is actually a flautist, uh, our lead actress. There you can see we made this show in an old, um, abandoned swimming pool. It is Edwardian. Um, we are walking here on top of the pool. And what it meant was that we could actually put uh, sound under the, under the, in the pool underground so that when there was a bombing raid, the ground moved and we used it through woofers and um, tweeters and, and uh, bass and got that to move. Uh, also things like real fire in the space, um, anything you can see the audience there and how close they are and how, able, how close they are to the action. Um, this is a moment when uh, we had an aerial bombardment through projection mapping, haptics through the floor, um, a huge sound um, installation, directional sound. Um, and this uh, is one of the orphans sort of directing the music and the strafing. We also worked for the first time with animation, with Ardman Animations, who've made Chicken Run and Wallace and Gromit, who were kind enough to come on board and be a collaborator with us. And part of the experience was projection mapped animation. Our narrative drivers, again, were very similar, but we used animation this time. Architectural projection mapping, again, I really think this is a, a, an amazing thing for theatre writers. Um, Object-based technology are familiar as this time I'll show you in a moment. Um, and mobile devices afterwards, a little offboarding again was that you started to hear Russian conversations on your phone as if they were leaking out of walls. These were our familiars. So you were given these, uh, you found these in the space in the snow, you put them around your neck. On the back of them were written handwritten notes about the last person who had owned these radios. 
Um, and the radios initially channeled the voices of the dead that came out of the walls, um, which was simple enough. But then later on, what we did was um, the audience began to realize that their radio was tuning up and that uh, one of you would be a violinist, one would be in timpani, the other would be third violin, but you were all individual instruments. And then you realize that if you stood together in the formation of a Russian orchestra, you played that they played, the speakers played Shostakovich's Leningrad. If you stepped out of that, it was disrupted. And then as you stepped back into it and you were the orchestra, uh, our lead actress then played the flute solo against the orchestra so that we all felt we were part of that experience. So our familiars, which we're becoming very well known for, um, had a strong relationship. Audiences really talked to them. So many people wanted to buy their wicker dolls, for instance, from Stick House. Uh, there was an emotional response in Ice Road when the speakers started to play Leningrad and you were stood together, people started holding hands and becoming a sort of congregation. And there was quite a lot of weeping at the moment. Uh, sometimes it was too much surprise. And the dolls, sometimes when they gained their heartbeat, some audience members dropped them or threw them at the wall in surprise. We learned a lot from that. Um, the tech was established but we heavily repurposed. The audiences showed little interest in how they worked. It's only a couple of times somebody took them apart in the show, but mainly they just were glad, they, they just went with it. They suspended disbelief to believe these Soviet radios would channel the voices of the dead, which was a real big learning curve for us. Once again, they put the audience into a congregation and stimulated interaction between strangers. They allowed everything to be heightened, more personal, more visceral. And they also, I felt like as the playwright, I was whispering directly into the audience's ear that I could talk to them and they would hear me, that I was stood next, well, I was stood next to them most of the time. It's immersive, they could walk around and half the time I was in the room with them, they didn't know that. So I was stood right next to them, watching them up close and their reaction. It's a terrible, it's a, not terrible, it's a tremendous gift for a playwright to stand right next to somebody who's who was feeling their story for the first time. So then we started to plan The Undrowned, which is our third show, uh, as you can see, for 2020. Brilliant, which would happen in a factory or office space. Um, it was, it's about 18th, uh, 17th century, 18th century, sorry, wet nurse called Hope Good Shakespeare. And the fact that the audience are, have been called to her because in the morning she's about to be hung for murder. We were once um, foundlings who she nursed and she has called us back so she can tell us her story. One thing I should say about all the shows as well that we make, we also play with language. So in Stick House, one of our characters spoke mainly in Yiddish. In our second, one of our characters spoke mainly in Russian. And with this one, our character Hope Good speaks quite a bit in Kant, which is an 18th century robber's language. Um, uh, and we love playing with language. I think it's important when you're playing with tech is also to remember that, the, you know, remember the fundamentals and play with them too. Don't just let tech do all the heavy lifting. So with this, with the Andran, we were also looking at augmented reality for the first time. Um, I've done a lot of uh, work around augmented reality, but for the first time we were going to use it. Um, we were going to build it in an office space and it would be based in four huge white night dresses that would be used for projection and movement around the space so that they could move and be fluid too. Um, they are influenced by the art of Andrea Koch and uh, the British photographer, Tim Walker, would be our design uh, go-tos for when we're looking at what the world. And then, of course, the world stopped. And we decided to stop ourselves and look at research and development and resist the urge to produce. Um, I didn't want to just stream work in a flat way. I wanted to start thinking about what does it mean in COVID to be theatre practitioners with technology? How can we start telling stories really now in different ways? We've really got our answer to this call. 
it's 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 vital that we start changing and morphing pandemics could be here we could have another one again so let's think about the whole culture of what we're trying to make and a lot of this was informed by a fellowship I did with the Royal Shakespeare Company and Magic Leap that was due to premiere at South by Southwest in March in 2020, uh, where we were looking at immersion, live immersion with Magic Leap and food and drink and found objects. So a lot of the thinking at that time that I was doing was around that kind of transdisciplinary form. So then we stopped and we came up with not just the undrowned, we came up with the four acts of the undrowned and we started to get some funding into prototype. Chapter one was around marketing. I believe if you're going to expand your storytelling and make it durational, then why are we starting with the door of the theater or the door of the space in which you're making your immersion? Why aren't we starting way back? As soon as the audience sees the name of the show, we should start our storytelling there shortly. So we're looking at the actual marketing and what we can do around our marketing to imbue the sense of awe and wonder we want to instill in our final production. So we were given a, a, a fellowship in Bristol to look at how we can use AR in marketing leaflets and posters. Um, and my ambition for this would be that and one day in the railway station, there would be a poster and you could um, access the start of the story through AR in that poster and getting people who are passing by to start engaging, stories to jump out at walls at them as they pass by. This is a prototype that we're testing at the moment with audiences um, where uh, the hazelnut, which is a big part of the undrowned, um, it's a QR code, obviously, and it starts the story. It starts the world comes out of that hazelnut and it starts a small story to try and get you um, intrigued. Chapter two, uh, we got some we received funding and um, uh, from Creative XR to look at the chapter two of the Undrowned, which would be an at home tabletop theatre experience called The Foundling. Uh, a parcel would be delivered to your house. Uh, you'd have signed up for the experience, obviously. You will receive a parcel through the post um, and you would be invited through SMS text messaging um, and your mobile device to undo the parcel at a given time and place. Once again, looking at ritual. And in the parcel are a series of objects that you have to sort of put together. They're very simple. It's just inserting um, uh, objects into each other to make, there's a map and you insert in this uh, globe, which when you open it lights up. And then it triggers a uh, binaural soundscape along with AR where Hope Good Shakespeare starts to talk to you and show you the world in which she inhabits. Uh, we start with uh, the fact that she lives on the Essex marshes and the experience starts to show we travel over the Essex marshes in AR with her. The texture of the landscape is women's hair um, and we arrive at her house. Um, and we start to see where she lives and the world she occupies. So for this chapter two was world building. Um, and um, it was a 10 minute, 15 minute experience that then uh, could be repeated four times. So the idea was it was in chapters, this part. Um, you'd have chapter one, then a few days later, another parcel will turn up with chapter two and a new object. So that you were building up a series of objects that at the end of the four chapters would illuminate. And so I'm, I'm realizing I'm very short on time, so I'm wazzing through a bit. Chapter three uh, would be about narrative journeying. Um, it's about how we're thinking about when the audience are walking to the performance space, they're kind of coming together like a congregation then as they sort of career around the corner and walk up. Why don't we start narrative there in that corridor? As they're moving towards the theatre, why don't we get theatre stories to come out to them? So the story, you don't go to the door and open the door and it's there. It started to bleed out to you, like, um, like a bit like a port cochere. It comes out and it, it, it reaches you five minutes, ten minutes before you get to the theatre. 
And one of the things we were thinking about, we've called this experience Athona, is about weather and about Hope Goods weather in this Essex marsh that she lives in. And we began to think about one of the oldest technologies in the world, which is an umbrella, and how we might be able to give each audience member an umbrella that they find in the street. Um, and um, by opening it, we're using haptics and smell and projection mapping to build a stormy, storm-tossed night by which we are battling our way forward. And through binaural sounds, starting to hear children's voices, children playing, as we realize we're walking towards Hope Goods house in real life, and we're gonna see Hope Good for the first time, and she's going to tell us our story. So the idea is that then we take the weather into the space with us as well, with our umbrellas, and we get in and we see those four white dresses. So uh, this is very quickly what I was just saying. We curate the story. We transform an uh, urban landscape into the Essex marsh marshes. Um, we knit together the audience community. We lean, lean into animating objects again. And then chapter four is the immersive performance of The Undrowned. These are some amazing uh, pieces, material and images we found. Um, it will be a solo performance. It will be the culmination of the story of Hope Good Shakespeare. Like I said, we will use different language. And there will be a revelation of your role in her history. Um, we will use performance, projection mapping, animation, original score, haptic smell, binaural sound, AR, AI, and object-based media are familiars. And this time we are looking at how we can have familiars that are actually worn. Um, and these are called tokens. And when a child was left at the orphanage steps, if its mother decided later on in life she married well and her husband would allow her, she could come back and get her child. But if she'd left it anonymously, how would she recognize that child? So they would pop a little what called tokens into the swaddling of their baby as they left it and left it there. And the orphanage would take the baby in and then make a very, very detailed documentation of that baby, give it a new name, but also keep its token and I've seen them in uh, the Foundling Museum in London. They're astonishing. And they could be anything from a stamped penny to a piece of jewelry to a, a ring. Um, and this is one is an ale bottle label that was found on one of the babies. Um, and I was moved by these tiny little objects that have a whole child's DNA with their mother imprinted in it. And so what we want to do with the Undrowned is give each audience member their own token. And um, at some point that token will, I think you might come together and we're working on it and trigger something, trigger something in that room to change the space as you come together and become a congregation. Thank you, sorry, I realize I went at that at breakneck speed. Um, I do apologize, uh, but I wanted to try and um, give you the full narrative of how we feel about narrative and technology. This is, um, I have not used audio or video in this because Zoom is not always kind where that's concerned. But if you go to raucous.org.uk, there are films in there of the work we make. Thank you very much and I will stop sharing. Wow, thank you so much. You're just experimenting on so many levels. It's incredible. Um, let's see, we have all our panelists here. Uh, does anyone wanna start with a question for Sharon? And also to the attendees, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A and we will do our best to get to it. And you can see a lot of comments in the chat. People are very impressed. <laughs> okay, William. Yeah, Sharon, thank you so much. That it's astounding, amazing, inspiring work. Um, and I just want to. There, there's a million things I could ask. I just want to pick up on the notion of audience as community and your endeavors to forge that community. Um, I, I mean, I, I get how you've activated them in advance and sort of seduce them into the narrative world. At the location, what happens there that forms a community? Is it the, the shared anticipation over being in a new space or working with the familiars or how does that happen? Yeah, that's a really great question, William. Thank you. Um, we start the, 
we sort of build in rituals of our own that they have to sort of, I think, yes, we build rituals of our own that, that, that start as soon as they kind of arrive at the space. So with Stick House, for instance, as soon as they got there and they reported, all of our rushers are in obviously in costume, they report in, um, they were given a stamp on their hand, uh, but no mark was left. And they were given a new name on a board around their neck. And immediately they just started going, why haven't I got a, what's this stamp mean, talking to each other? And then they realized that the board around their neck was a name. And that actually, if they looked, they would find family, they were in a family. So, you know, Leo Hoffmeyer may find, but with no instruction, they just started to do that on its own. The space helps a lot in as much as with Stick House, it was a tiny little door in a massive wall. And everybody was just started talking immediately about what was going on through that door. And we did not curate it at all. We just allowed them to chatter. And then we had placed an actor within them. So he just started straight away when they all turned around and realized. The giving out of the familiars is the big moment where we leave the familiars in the space and we just allow them to figure out how they put them on or how they wear them. And they are amazing. We did some experimenting with a scientist around how we identify the alpha in the group and appeal to the alpha to try to get the whole group to do something together. And it's rubbish, you don't need it. It's just somebody will step up and go, oh, there's dolls, they've got names on, and then call them out. Um, there's always somebody who'll do that. Um, in uh, Ice Road, um, the, um, the action started while the audience were in the bar still having their drink 10 minutes earlier than they expected. So the actresses came out from behind things, talking in Russian and trying to steal off people. Um, and that started people sort of sticking together and, and, and they, they, um, they're really great. I didn't expect it. I expect them to be much more um, um, taciturn and not wanting to, to be, but actually they came in and were incredibly open spirited about it. Um, and also just wanted to check with each other. They check with each other. We're doing okay. This is okay. Are you okay? They check in. It's quite amazing to watch this animal move. So um, we're still trying lots of different things, but that's kind of, we just allow them to get on with it and the space to do that in a way. Sorry, William, it's not very clear. Thanks, thanks. Great, David, you have a question. There we go. I'm wondering if you could talk a little more uh, about your process from a writer's perspective of how do you think about writing for multimodal experiences that go beyond what we traditionally capture in a traditional uh, you know, script? Um, how does this change the writing process and how do you think about that process? It's a great question. Thank you very much. It's been a very painful process. I'm going to be totally blunt with you. It's been a really incredibly painful and frustrating process at times um, because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't. I'm making up processes as I go along. And also I'm having to find a language to work with other people that I didn't know I had access to. So when Tom and I started together, we fell out a lot because he's a technologist and he needs everything to be tested and milestoned and beat it out and, and in massive spreadsheets. And, and I'm going, I'm a writer, I throw things up against the wall and see if they stick. Took us a long time to try to find a way to work together. Um, I found a new way of, uh, all of my scripts now look, don't look like theatre scripts anymore, obviously. They are um, colour coded. I've become very weird about it. I just, I don't know what's happened to me. I've become an organizational czar where the scripts are color coded. Um, but also um, I have two scripts. I have a technical script, which is how I and the technologists see this world working mechanically, the mechanics, so to speak. Then I have another script, which is written much more lyrically for the designers to think about it in a very lyrical heightened way so the kind of the feel and the texture of the of of how it looks and how it will appear to the audiences and then another script which is the under the, the the swan 
sort of scrabbling along as she swims along is all the stuff that happens beneath. Um, I start with a idea and then we all sit down straight away, all of us, and I explain to them, I'm interested in the siege of Leningrad, for instance. And then we will start together trying to put bones on that. And as a writer, that's very exposing because you have to listen to other people at a time when you don't want to, or you want it your own way. It's your writing, but actually you can't do that anymore. You have to listen. This is ownership by everybody. And you don't have all the answers as a writer. You just don't. Other people can help you and do that heavy lifting with you if you just allow it. Um, but I find it incredibly freeing. I can, I, I can vision things of scale that I could never do in a theatre, tiny little things that we can do through VR, huge things that we could do through massive projection mapping. The scale of, of it as a writer is really freeing. I hope, I think, sorry, David, that's a hope that answers it. No, I mean, that's a good start. And just very exciting to see the things that you're doing and how you're involving the audience in ways that it makes sense to do it um, with this technology as opposed to just being like a surface item that is not conquest. Everything seem to do it so constitutional to the story and that's mm -hmm. really inspiring. Thank you so much. It's really important to me. That's what I am. And that's what my team are now. And we take great pride in that. And do you know what? If it doesn't fit the story, it goes end of. It, it, there's no point. I, I wanted holograms for ages. Holograms, 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 holograms. I want a hologram. And the people who said no to me were the technologists who then went, it doesn't fit the story. And I could have wept at that point. So it was like, thank goodness, we've got it right. Thank you. All right, Kat. Thanks, Joan. I'm going to piggyback on David's uh, question to you as a writer. Um, so much of this kind of work has been built out of the text of Shakespeare. Mm. And it feels like um, there's this necessity to have Shakespeare there as the guardrails as we move into this unknown world of all these crazy technologies in theater. So I, I just wanted to, I wanted to ask you your opinion on that and how, you know, um, I know that in, in England, you have a particular relationship to Shakespeare, but I'm curious to, to hear from your perspective as a writer who's worked in this space for a long time, you know, why so much Shakespeare and how, how you know, not, not to diss Shakespeare, but- No, no, a, no. Uh, I do diss Shakespeare. the palette. I do diss Shakespeare from time to time, I'll be honest. So I'm just gonna hold my hands up there. Um, uh, Pericles, not a good play. Um, um, I think, I think there is something, and I'm not disparaging here, I don't, do not want to disparage anything, but I think there is something about having a, there is a certain viewpoint about having a established traditional text that then you morph and transform through the use of technology, which is one way of looking at it because that's what audiences know. Audiences know the text. So if you're going to, I don't know, mess with it with tech, whichever way you want to look at it, and the audience experience, you want to shift, then using something they know really well helps. It does help make them feel secure. For me, personally, uh, I, I am a writer, so I am really intrigued by how theatre makes work specifically for tech. No with tech, I'm sorry, that where one isn't the adjunct to another, one doesn't exist and then the other one redefines or reinterprets, but that the two come together and, and reimagine each other. Um, so I write, when, I, when it is in my head and I am thinking of these things and we are in what we call creative sprints together where we lock ourselves away, is, is those two things, tech, and story dovetail completely, and one cannot exist without the other. I think it's laudable that Shakespeare is being reimagined. We need to keep reimagining him. He's very old now. Um, and I think it's great. And I certainly, I work with the RSC and the piece I did, Where Once We, is off the back of Puck, A Midsummer Night's Dream. So, um, I, uh, and those big houses can afford to do it. Um, that's the other thing with being, you know, an independent is, uh, the money. 
but you know I think it's I think it's really I think there's room for everybody um it's just for me personally it's original it has to be an, an original idea great um, so we have a question, a couple of questions from attendees, one from Patty Zimmerman, who says, um, might you elaborate more on the intricacies of the collaborative process with this team? Challenges, debates, solutions, processes, you've talked about it from the point of view of writing, but perhaps some of the other challenges. Mm. Yeah, um, I think, I think the most challenging thing when you're trying to make something together is having to invent processes and methodologies that are re reactive a little bit because you don't know what's coming up. I talk about it and we talk about it. It's like half the time we are literally laying out the track as the train is coming. You know, we're literally like tut, 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 because we we don't know which way we're going to go. Um, we had to find a new language together. I think I mentioned that, which means that I don't speak, I don't code. I have no idea anything works. I can't even open my MacBook sometimes and get that to work. I'm just totally... So finding a space where we could all feel at risk and not be afraid of looking stupid in front of each other, where I can go, I need this thing to happen or I'd like it to happen. How do we do that? And they go, well, we've got either this issue or this issue, and I can I could solve it this way or this way. What do you think? But they have begun to realize that if they go into the depths of that with me, I'm I'm gonna get frustrated. So we learn to give each other space. And the same with story is a lot of the time they know to leave me to wrangle it um, and help where we can. Um, so it it is painful hierarchies have had to go obviously everybody looks at me all the time but i'm trying to stop that happening we're trying to have a really flat surface and, and it does work people are given individual projects to work on like i we want this thing to happen can you just go away and look at how that might work come back with some solutions that works really well for us um, and then they could come back and go right these four solutions i think this is the most interesting this is the most expensive because narrative can change and warp and meld. I can rewrite round things, four things, all that sort of thing. So we are constantly evolving. I think messiness has to be embraced. I think, um, and I think that's important that you imbue that in your team. Is this is gonna be messy and it's gonna be at times really rough. Um, sorry, I. We don't, we, we keep trying to write down process to try and share it with people. And every time we look at it, I feel like I'm in a playground because it's all just a bit like, you know, it, something happens. All right, we'll take one more question from Michael Connelly. Connelly. Uh, uh, regarding the storytelling versus story finding, does the latter diverge significantly amongst the different performances? And do you modify the performance accordingly? Okay, great. I am going to put my hand up here now because I made a decision a very long time ago. Is It is not about story finding. So we're not punch drunk. So where punch drunk ask you, it's fractured narrative and you've, you make sense out of that for what, whichever way you have. And I've seen probably nearly every punch drunk show is, um, you know, you are allowed to... Um, move where and when you wear a mask, you know, you interact with your space, it's huge. And you find your own meaning, it's, it's meaning making. Um, I decided very early on that the work we are making is to look at the theater sector. And so I tell a story and we help you, guide you through it. Now you can go off and have a little wander and everything else, but at some point we will bring you back together because this moment is really, really in integral. Because sometimes with the meaning making shows, I would sometimes miss the show because I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I felt for me, it was really important that if we're gonna put all this love and care into a piece, then I wanna make sure you get the full narrative experience. So uh, we will allow moments of wandering off 
and then we will uh, not through ashes, but through actors, through through bugs, through projection mapping, bring everybody back together to then reveal the next part of that narrative. So we did talk a lot about story finding, i.e., them going off and and making their own meaning, or do we interpret meaning for them and give them the story beginning, middle, end, and for me, that was where, that was what was missing at the time. Um, and listening to audiences saying that they were missing having an immersive experience that wasn't a game, but was just pure storytelling was, was important. On that note, we're gonna have to end, we're out of time, but thank you so much, Sharon. It's incredible work. And thank you to the panelists and thank you to the attendees. We hope you'll see it. We'll see you next week. And until then, thank you.